Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with John White, President and CEO of the Consortium of Ocean Leadership. John has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, John, for joining us today. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thanks, Mark. So the ocean is pervasive. It affects all of us, mm -hmm. but sometimes we just walk through our day and we don't think about the air we breathe, the food we eat, and the weather we experience and how the ocean affects that. Talk about the ocean in the context of how it affects all of us today. First of all, of course, the ocean covers about 71% of our planet. Uh, we are largely a land species that is living on an ocean planet. Uh, but in order to, to be successful, and we have shown in order, order to, to actually be successful, we need to understand that ocean we need to use that ocean for our own health and prosperity, our commerce, the food that we eat, and we do that on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think we're just now starting to come to grips with the importance of ensuring the ocean can really continue to support us and our fellow species on the land in the future. As we grow in terms of our population, we rely so much for food, for water, for energy, of course, whether it's oil and gas that comes out of the ocean floor, it's energy that we're able to get from waves, and more and more we're looking at the ocean in terms of an energy source for re renewable energy as well, um, offshore wind farms and these type of things. So it's just understanding that and having everybody, every human that lives on this planet understand the importance of the ocean, I think, can allow us to ensure that we don't do things and make decisions to damage the ocean and actually to prevent it from being uh, the, the resource that we need today and are going to need going forward for all those reasons. How do we now start to change ourselves so that we are better stewards of the ocean? One way we change ourselves is to make sure that the problem is being heard and understood that I think uh, much of our population as you mentioned uh, at the beginning of, of the conversation, doesn't understand the scope of the problem, the scope of the ocean. In or terms how important of, of it our is relation, to their lives. How important lives. it is to their everyday lives. So we have to also make people understand that uh, we need to use science to, and to impact our de de decision making, whether to drill or not to drill, whether to fish or not to fish, whether to build something along a coastline or not. Based on data and evidence. Based on data and evidence. But all that in understanding to be able to actually predict that is scientific, it's based on scientific research. So the importance of scientific research, and that's what we are, is, is really a, uh, a con consortium of about 95 sci ocean science and ocean technology institutions, academic and otherwise. We need to champion that knowledge. That knowledge provides the key to solving these problems, to being a better steward. If you, but if you don't understand what the science is telling you, you don't invest in the science to give us better and better answers, then you're still gonna be making, you know, just like 30 years ago, we made actual decisions on whether to evacuate with an oncoming hurricane, maybe two days in advance. Now, we're making it five days in advance. That's due to scientific research. By the way, not just about the atmosphere, because hurricanes, really they form over the ocean and it's the ocean is the energy source. So, but understanding those type of things allow us to make better decisions, long-term and short-term, and really be better stewards, understanding what is happening. So in terms of coral bleaching, we, we talked about, okay, we see it happening. Why is it happening? Why is it happening to this reef and not that reef? Can we learn something from the reef that is still healthy and be able to go in and treat the other one? Can we do that in enough time and over a large enough area to really have a positive impact? Or if not, what are we going to do about it? Same thing with fisheries, with species that are overfished. Same thing with our coastlines and understanding in, in de detail. So a lot of this is really championing the science. And that's why that's what we do is, you know, we try to shape the future of ocean science and t technology to help answer those problems and questions. It seems that we also have another challenge uh, ahead of us as Americans. We tend to um, choose the short-term thinking over long-term thinking so often. 
we choose quarterly profits over profits that are that we that we think uh, might accrue over uh, three, five, and ten-year periods. We choose the uh, good of tomorrow over over uh, behaviors that will uh, be more sustainable. It seems to me that we can have all the evidence in the world over here, but if the evidence in the world is all about long-term health and long-term good and and be able to to function as society, <laughs> whereas over here we can function as individuals and profit ourselves. We individually, as Americans, too often seem to choose the the short term. I, I think part of that is human nature, yeah, but we and we say this a lot in the the military as well is that you know that that we uh, that we sacrifice the important. As we overfocus on the urgent, and sometimes we do that as well. And then, you know, if sea level is rising, and I say, "Well, I'm just going to raise my home by a foot, or I'm going to build a seawall," at some point, maybe you got to think about, "Well, if this house, if my children, or even my grandchildren, are going to live in this house, maybe is there an opportunity to move it somewhere?" Or to relocate, and how would I plan for, for doing that? This is some of the, this is not some seeing the, the forest questions. for the trees. This is this is where <laughs> tactics overshadow strategy, and you exactly. lose sight you sight of the uh, of what a, you're trying to accomplish. But there's got to be a balance, and that's why I think it's important for our federal government uh, to ensure that we're balancing those urgent needs with the important longer term st 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 strategic interests. Uh, again, whether it's relation to energy, water all these type of security issues and human health as well. All these things are, we need to have, we need to maintain that long view. While we certainly have to resolve the crisis, the aftermath of a hurricane or some other event, fires that have happened in California, we have to deal with that. But long term, how do we understand it better? Are there weather patterns that, that are shifting because of climate shifts that are going to create more fires in certain region that we could have better solutions and be better understanding of what's going to happen in advance so we can move resources to try to, to prevent damages like that. These are the type of longer term things. I think you're right. We miss those a lot of times as we focus on the what's going to happen tomorrow, what happened yesterday, what are the urgent needs. How do you get people to come together and say, you know something, we're going to invest for 100 years before, we, before our children's children's children see any impact? I lose sleep, and we have a lot of conversations <laughs> dealing with exactly that problem, Mark, of how do we influence the individual thinking and decision-making and the understanding, again, part of our key words and our basic part of our mission is, you know, advanced, like I said, it's uh, take the future of ocean science and technology through di discovery, understanding, and action. That understanding is the key piece there, understanding the scope of the problem. And getting away from, again, this, you know, short-term, immediate sort of return on the investment of my time and the money, the, the resources, and all this, we focus on these things more and more. It seems like it's a it's Well, a right monetizing now, a fishery until the fishery collapses, and right? Yeah, exactly, but not having the long view of, okay, what am I going to do? What am I, as you said, my sons and daughters, their sons and daughters, we've been in the fishing business for decades. A great example of that is, you know, there was a, a, a gentleman who's uh, given a lot of talks, he did for us, who uh, his family had been in the lobster business in uh, Long Island Sound for many, many years, for several ge ge generations. The lobsters weren't there anymore. So he's sitting around there, well, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to move. Or, you know, somebody mentioned, you know, so, you know, the scallops and stuff grow on the same kind of structures as those lobster pots that you're not catching any lobster with. So you had an idea, what if I started farming for scallops using the same baskets, wooden baskets in this case, what scallops really like to adhere to, and now he's got a profitable business of growing, of farming the ocean, which we can talk about, and that's one of the key things, sustainably farming the ocean is a, that's really an opportunity as for food security. As opposed to extracting as opposed to just overfishing and extracting. You know, we learned this again on land about a century ago. You know, if you just go out and you shoot everything and eat it, or you rip everything that you can eat off of the landscape, 
that doesn't work, especially with a growing population, whether it's due, uh, you know, to, to a lot of people coming over to a developing country like we had in our country. You learn to cultivate and farm, and that's a much better model, and sustainably so that as you use, true, as you use wood from trees, you're growing more trees. As you eat fish, you're growing more fish. By the way, it also allows the natural habitats to be much more healthy, the fishermen, and everything you know there's a balance to well, all maybe this. that's part of the that's part of the key is finding a different way that 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 does not say economics bad earning money bad <laughs> i mean that's not going to work right no because we all love to you know well we all we we all have to put bread on the table yep. so that that isn't the approach so maybe the approach is, is to find a different way of thinking where you honor the economic uh, activity but you also um, encourage people to think in the way that this gentleman is yep. thinking. How do you farm as opposed to extract? One of the real, I think we have an opportunity now is also more and more to look at social science and social scientists and bring them together with the physical scientists, if, if you will, the ocean scientists, agricultural scientists, so that, you know, I like to think that I understand people and I'm a pretty good judgment of character and all these type, type of things. But boy, I make mistakes all the time, not just at home with my own family, of trying to understand how they're going to respond mm -hmm. <laughs> to scientific evidence or something that I say, for example. But there are people who are really good at that, who study that, who understand the psychology, whether it's individuals or larger populations and populations at different places. Because that's another thing. We're so different around the world. So what may work in Norway may not work on the Gulf of Mexico coast. It may not work in Africa or Indonesia or somewhere else. It's understanding how to bring world population, like, and even our national population. We're pretty diverse, as we all know, in terms of, of our opinions, in terms of our beliefs, um, whether po political or otherwise, but certainly science as well. How do we bring social experts to get those messages, to educate people, not just about the science, but about understanding the larger problems and then how does it impact their overall decisions? And to think about, yes, this does impact my children. John White, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Consortium of Ocean Leadership. Thank you so much for describing this balanced approach that you wish to take and, uh, and really our hearts and minds are, are, are with you because the health of the ocean and your success in drawing people together in this effort is, is so important to, to us, to, to our daily lives and to the lives of future generations. Thank you so much for, for sharing the, uh, the, the work of the Consortium of Ocean Leadership with us and thank you. Well, so it's much been an honor, and I hope uh, I get passionate about this and I could go on for days, but hopefully I can share a little bit of my enthusiasm and passion. It's a little bit c contagious as well because I think there's a positive message to go on top of the concern here. So thanks for the opportunity to talk to you, Mark.